Welcome back. Today I want to talk about, I think, the dominant virtue, if you will, in the far and the near uh, and the Middle East. Um, as a matter of fact, in many ways, it's the dominant virtue of the ancient world. But even if you go to those regions today, if you go to the areas of the Middle East and even portions of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, you'll discover that the dominant virtue of the region is a concept called zinnia. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. Uh, we don't really actually have a good translation for it in English. Uh, it would be a beautiful name. Someone named their, their daughter Zania. And But the best I could give you for a definition is hospitality. But I think that's not a very adequate uh, translation, but that would be the closest thing that we could get to it. You see, back in the days, uh, the biblical days, in, and in the Greek era, and even into the Roman era, they didn't have hotels at, at every stop. And even when you think of an inn, an inn isn't exactly like stopping, you know, at a <clears throat> Best Western or something like that. So if you wanted to travel, it was very expensive because you needed to carry everything with you, including your own lodging, uh, which is why only the wealthy traveled. And most people rarely traveled more than about 10 miles from their hometown because it was too hard and too dangerous. But people needed to travel, people needed to get around, and it's, it was important for the survival of a culture that you have people moving around. And so there's a concept called zinnia, hospitality. And this is really important when you're reading the Odyssey, but I would also argue that it's very important when you're reading the Bible. Because how is it that you could tell in the Odyssey who the good people are? Well, it's actually not that hard. The good people have Zania and the bad people don't, which is true very much in the Bible as well. The good people have Zania, the bad people don't. How does it work? Hospitality, or Zania, I should say, simply works that if I come to your place of lodging with a gift and I ask to, to stay, or even if I just ask for some refreshment, um, because I've offered you a gift, you are, by the unwritten but very, very powerful law, of Zania, you are obligated to take me in for as long as I need and to feed me and to tend to my needs so that I can get going again. And this is important, otherwise people die. Uh, and this is how we tell in the Odyssey who the good people are from the bad people. Now I want you to think about this and I hope you've been reading because otherwise what I'm saying here uh, may not make sense. And I don't care if I'm giving a spoiler, but think about Odysseus. He's traveling around with his, his cohort of, of men from the war. And there's not a hotel to stay, so they must rely on the generosity of people that they run into. So when Odysseus, for example, runs into the Cyclops, Polyphemus, he, uh, they come with a gift. They bring him wine and good wine. And they expect that this giant with one eye, the Cyclops, will then return the kindness by giving them lodging and even feeding them. Instead, the Cyclops, Polyphemus, returns that kindness by locking them up in his cave, his cave and eating them. And that is not what 
is considered proper. Uh, and this is why we would read this, if we're reading this uh, as a good Greek, a good Roman, even a good Hebrew would, would that we would see that Odysseus is very much in the right for attacking Polyphemus, attacking the, the Cyclops by taking out his eye. Not only is that the only way that he can think of, a very clever way, because he's very clever, to get out of this predicament, but it is a kind of justice, if you will, because he, uh, clearly, the Cyclops was not willing to uh, return the gift with Xenia. The, the poem begins with Odysseus having been at sea for a very long time, and he's actually right now, uh, uh, we'll, we'll say, um, a prisoner. Uh, kind of a sex slave, if you will, to Calypso, the goddess and witch Calypso. And he's come to her desperate. He doesn't even have a gift. He's lost all his men. And she returns this, not by giving him Xenia, but by holding him captive as a kind of sex slave. Uh, similarly, Circe, the witch, they come to her in desperate need for help. And she too returns the favor by turning them into animals. Meanwhile, back at home in Ithaca, you have uh, Homer, uh, uh, sorry, Odysseus's wife, Penelope. And Penelope is the embodiment of what is good in this region because the suitors, these are men who live in the region who assume that Odysseus must be dead by now. I mean, he was at war for 10 years and everybody's come home from the war except for Odysseus, he must have been lost. And so they would love nothing more than to have her hand in marriage because whoever gets her hand in marriage gets to be the king, will inherit Odysseus's wealth and his land and of course his kingship and take it even away from his son Telemachus. So they each come with gifts and then Penelope is obligated, obligated to take care of them for as long as they want and need. And now while we look at her as the embodiment of good, these suitors who are there are the opposite of that. Yes, they did come. They asked for uh, lodging. They've come uh, with gifts, but now they're taking advantage of the hospitality where they're consuming all of the food and the wine and the cheese and making themselves essentially kind of boorish guests in the house. And they're not good examples. Everywhere you look in the Odyssey, it's really a simple way to know who are the good people and who are not. Um, now, one thing I'm gonna say is that this is also how you tell the good people from the bad people in the Bible. Uh, there are stories in the Bible that are very difficult for us in our modern way of thinking to understand and explain. Uh, one, of course, is Jephthah's daughter, but maybe a better and, and a more famous example is the story of Lot. Um, now, Lot, is, and many of you are familiar with the story, uh, of course, these uh, angels, no one knows they're angels, or, but these angels first appear to Abraham. Or to, and, and to Abraham, uh, they come and Abraham takes them in because he's good and he shows them hospitality. He says, no, 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 no. You must stay here at my place and I will feed you. And when you read the text, Abraham feeds them the best of his flock and just takes absolute good care of them. And it's because of this, notice that it's because of this that we, we're able to see that Abraham is a good man. And they even refer to him as a good man because of what he has done. So Abraham shows Zania. Now these same uh, men, angels, go down to the city of Sodom where Lot is living, Abraham's nephew. 
Now they are staying, are, are they are out there in the town square and they're planning to spend the night in the town square. And if you know anything about Sodom, it's not a safe place to stay. Law just happens to see them there. And this is how we know Lot is a good man. Lot says, no, you cannot stay here. You must come to my house. And of course they say, no, 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 we'll stay here. And he insists until they come. Now, what Genesis tells us is that later that night, as Lot is showing hospitality, showing Zania to these men, then there's a knock on the door. And Genesis says all the men and the boys show up. And they say, send us out these men that are in your house so we may have sex with them. Well, Lot does something that has always bothered me. It bothers me still, actually. And it probably should bother us because this is going against one of our main virtues. I would argue in many ways that the highest virtue in our culture is not Zania, but family. Family is the highest, uh, the highest virtue in our culture which is why you know we'll often have expressions like blood is thicker than water and people get angry if you say something about their family you know they could say all they want about their family but don't you dare say anything bad about the family uh we really value our family and this doesn't mean we all live up to this value this doesn't mean our culture lives up to it it just means that this is where our highest virtues are. Do you see this in film and in story and everything? That family is everything. Uh, and it doesn't mean hospitality, hospitality doesn't mean anything, but not as much as family. If some stranger comes to your door and says, here's a gift, can I stay at your house? You're probably gonna say, no. You can go down over here to the local motel. Why? It's because you don't know if it's safe for your family. Um, so that's a good example of this. Uh, so Law does something that's a little alarming. He says, don't do this evil thing by uh, doing something bad to the men who are guests in my house, because that would be breaking the law of Zanina. Zania. Instead, here, you may have my two virgin daughters instead to do with what you want. Now, I hope that you hear that and it bugs you because it should. Because in our culture, uh, taking care of family, especially one's children, is the highest virtue. So we're repulsed by this. Believe it or not. We are meant in this account to view this as a great honor and virtue on the part of Lot. That not because he's sacrificing his daughters to these men, but that he would be willing to do so in order to uh, keep the honor of his guests. In other words, despite the love that he has for his daughters, that he would sacrifice that rather than have someone within his house that he has pledged to take care of be hurt in some way. Um, I don't know if that actually helps a whole lot, but it does actually in some ways maybe make sense of uh, that story. And it helps us make sense of the Odyssey as well. So it helps us understand why, even though in some ways Odysseus seems to be immoral in his lack of, uh, well, let's just say he doesn't seem, to, he seems to be having his way with a variety of goddesses. Uh, I can imagine him getting home to Penelope and explaining, yes, it's true, I did it with a lot of goddesses, but I did it thinking of you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't imagine that happening. but. Um, but we're meant to view that as a kind of honorable thing because he is ultimately 
been imbued, been treated uh, uh, by these goddesses in an act, uh, a very poor act of Xenia. And we're meant to view when he is taken in and taken care of as an act of great virtue. Um, now, this isn't just an Old Testament idea, by the way, um, because it's interesting, Jesus, and not to get preachy, I can't help sometimes, but you know, there's the pastor in me. But it's interesting that Jesus talks very little in his ministry about judgment. So there are only two times that I can think of that he speaks of judgment. One, of course, is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which is kind of a retelling of an old joke that they would have been familiar with. But the other one, and maybe a, a better example, is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And essentially is describing two groups of people. One group is gonna make it and one group isn't. But notice what it is that determines whether or not they make it. So you have the one group that he says, come on in, you're my friends, I have a place for you. And, and then he says, and notice he describes what they've done. What he describes is Zania. He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes. And when I was in prison, you visited me. In other words, you showed me Zania. Isn't that interesting that the one example of judgment uh, that he gives, it doesn't say you knew the right doctrines or you made sure that you obeyed these certain precepts. No, you were hospitable. You showed Zania. And then this other group that, like this other group, they, 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 maybe they did, you know, they went to the right schools and learned their lessons and went to Bible class and got A's and, and they uh, seem to be doctrinally correct. He says, no, go away. I don't know you because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And when I was naked, you didn't give me any clothes. And when I was in prison, you didn't visit me. You didn't show me Zania. Therefore, I will not give you Zania. Um, that's an interesting take there. And something maybe that we as contemporary Christians and contemporary people ought to take into consideration, not taking away family as the highest value, but to remember that I think Zania still very much should be a value. How we treat people who we take in and we're looking for people who need to be taken in and taking care of them. So I'm gonna ask a little question here about that. I want to talk a little, have you talk about this, some examples in the text of Zania or poor Zania in the text? And uh, then give me an example, perhaps that you've been doing some reading and you could see it at play. I also have another video that I'm attaching. I really would like you to watch this. That explains a little bit about Zania as well. And uh, I think that'll be useful. Um, for our final session, we're gonna be going into the underworld and talking a little bit about that. But we're also gonna talk about some of the archetypal characters as well, because uh, Odysseus is gonna go into the underworld and he's going to uh, look, be looking for a blind prophet. And I wanna talk about that as the archetypal character. We're gonna talk about the femme fatale. And lastly, uh, I would like to then kind of make a few final comments. I do have one final lecture, so we'll have one extra this time. And uh, anyway, so pay attention to this next video, and I would love for you then to answer the question. Thank you so much.